This is part two of the introduction to Verilog, and we will continue with the behavioral description of circuits in Verilog, and we will extend it also to having hierarchical circuits in Verilog, where one module can be a submodule of another model, uh, module, and so forth. Specifying a circuit uh, by a Boolean expression is still rather close to actually the details of, an impl of a particular imp implementation with AND and OR gates and so forth. And to formulate it in terms of a Boolean expression is still requiring quite a bit of work if you want to describe a large circuit. So now rather than using that, we can use things like an if-else statement. So if one thing happens, then do this. If another thing happens, then do that. Or later we will see there is also a case statement in Verilog um, where you can distinguish between, let's say, for example, four different cases. Or there is a while statement and four statements and a number of other um, such ways of expressing the behavior of a circuit. So this gives us a higher level of abstraction, and statements of this form are called uh, procedural statements, okay, um, as opposed to continuous uh, statements like the assign statement. So for the half adder, we can now write our Verilog code in this way. So we start, of course, again with the keyword module. We have to give it a name. We call it here half add underbar behave2 because it's the second version of a behavioral description of that half adder. We need to declare the inputs and outputs, so the port directions. But now you notice that there is something new here. For the output C, the carry, that remains the same, but for the output register S, we have added the keyword, keyword register. So that's now not going to be a continuous assignment anymore. It's going to be something that gets stored in some memory location and uh, gets updated only every once in a while when something happens that requires such an update, and in between, uh, it's just being read out from that memory. So procedural statements, they must be inside an always block. Okay, so the always block starts with the keyword always, and then there is the at sign, and then a list of things in parentheses. This list is called the sensitivity list, and what this indicates is that this particular always block here which extends uh, from up here to down here. This is the whole uh, block. This particular block has to be recomputed whenever a change in A or in B occurs. So now the actual uh, block here and the procedural statement, what we are saying here is that if A is not equal to B, then S has to be equal to 1. So what we are expressing here is the fact that if we have 0 plus 0, then we get 0. If we have 1 plus 0 or 0 plus 1, then we get the 1. And if we have 1 plus 1, we also get the 0. So if a and b in our summation are different, then we need to have a 1 at the output. And if they are the same, then we need to have a 0 at the output. So we write this as if A is not equal to B, so the exclamation point here and then equal, that means is not equal, then S is equal to 1, else S is equal to 0. We could have written this as if A is equal to, that requires two equal signs, B, then S is equal to 0, and else s is equal to 1. That would give us the same functional behavior with um, 
just comp uh, looking for the case uh, of equality first rather than the case of inequality. And then uh, after that else statement, the always block is finished. And now comes a continuous assignment, assign C equal to A and B. Okay, so that's a continuous assignment. So the output of a continuous assignment has to be a wire or just uh, or a net, or we just simply don't mention it here. We could have written output wire C, but uh, that's usually not done because it's implicit. If you don't specify register, then it's assumed that it's a wire or a net. Whereas for S in here in the structural, uh, in the procedural statement, we must um, use a register, otherwise the compiler will complain. So we have now two different cases uh, in that little example of how to assign outputs to variables. An always block can contain a single uh, statement as here, so that if else, that's considered to be a single statement, or it could have uh, multiple statements. And the module can contain several always blocks. So I could have had another always with a sensitivity on something else, and then uh, some procedure in there. Or I could have tried to put everything into one always block. That depends a little bit on how you want to structure your programs and how easily readable you want to make them. So just to see how that works, we now want to make a behavioral description which has two procedural statements as opposed to just one that we had in the previous example. So instead of the uh, continuous assignment for the carry equal to uh, is assign C equal to A and B, we can use a procedural assignment, which is just simply C is equal to A and B without the assign keyword in front of it. And we're going to put that inside the always block. K1 okay, of the reasons why one might want to do something like that is that uh, statements in, inside an always block are evaluated in the order in which they are given, whereas continuous assignments are evaluated concurrently or in parallel, if you wish. So now this is our third um, behavioral specification of the half adder. Inputs are the same as before, input a comma b, that doesn't change. Output is now such that both c and s are going to be registered because both c and s will be computed inside the always block. Okay, now we have two statements inside the always block, the if else, which again just counts as one, and then the assignment statement here, C is equal to A uh, and B. And whenever you have more than one statement in an always block, you have to use the keyword begin and then end at the end in order to encapsulate uh, the commands that go into the uh, always block so that the compiler knows uh, which uh, part of all of those things have to uh, are belonging to the same always statement. The sensitivity list remains the same as before. The if else uh, statement uh, I left the same as it was before and the C, um, the carry is now just actually also the same as before but we, we do not write a sign in front of it. If you were to write a sign in front of it inside an always block, then uh, Verilog would complain because it does not want to assign anything to a net or a wire inside of an always block. That has to go to a register. There are some variations here on that sensitivity list on the uh, always for the always block. So always at and then a comma b in the parentheses means that the block is always executed, uh, executed whenever a or b or both uh, are changing. It is also possible to just simply write always at and then a star or even always at star without the parentheses here and let the compiler figure out which signals need to be considered. For small examples, that is certainly no problem uh, to do this. If you work on large designs, it can take 
uh, overnight or even a couple of days to uh, verify the functionality of something like uh, a modern uh, multiprocessor or something like that. And then uh, it does become crucial to be able to execute some of those statements only when it's really necessary because that cuts down then on the simulation time. We will not have to be concerned about that too much. It is um, good uh, practice though to show the sensitivity list at the beginning of an always block because in this way if somebody else reads the, uh, this very log code they can see what that um, particular block is depending on as um, input variables that, that could change. Now just like you use subroutines for example in C programming in order to break up larger pieces of code into smaller more manageable pieces and also have some of it reusable we can have a hierarchical coding in Verilog okay and in this way uh, we start from a top level module and then several instances of lower level modules which may contain submodules themselves in order to accomplish a particular task or, or obtain a particular uh, logic function from a circuit. Okay, the lower level modules are instantiated inside a higher level module as opposed to being called from the higher level module. So the, here the analogy with uh, programming like C programming uh, breaks down. Uh, the, should not think of a module as being truly a subroutine. It's just a piece of hardware um, inside some FPGA, for example, that's being placed in into another module. Uh, but it's not that, that um, there is this piece of hardware sitting somewhere, and then you just ship things out to that module, and then it comes back, and then somebody else else can use that module. That module, when it is instantiated, it's placed in there as the piece of hardware that's being that's being dedicated uh, to that um, function of that particular higher level module. Okay, now we need to understand a little bit what that lower level module looks like, uh, or what the inputs and outputs of that look like. Um, for the lower le level module itself and also for the higher level module inside which it is being instantiated. Okay, so here is a picture for that. We have a lower level module. The input of, uh, as seen by the lower level module is going to be a net or a wire. The output of that lower level module could be either a net or a register. Then the input um, of the lower level module as seen by the higher level module could be a net or a register. And the output of the lower level module as seen by the higher level module has to be a net. So when you uh, put a lower level module in, inside a higher level module, you basically make a wire connection from the point of view of the higher level module. So one thing that that it implies is that you cannot use um, lower level modules or instantiations of modules inside a procedural block such as an always block. So uh, this is uh, verse uh, pointing out here. So in particular, this implies that modules cannot be instantiated inside a procedural block. That's uh, one of the common mistakes that people make in the beginning when they use Verilog is they try to put one of those blocks inside, uh, one of those uh, modules inside an always block. So to see an example of using hierarchical Verilog code, we are going to make a full adder from two half adders. So we have a first half adder here uh, we're going to call this HA1 and the second half adder HA2. And if you look 
So the combination here, or you look at the truth table of a full adder, then you can uh, relatively easily see that um, the way it's combined here, that this will indeed produce a sum and a carry from now three inputs. The half adder only had two bits of an input. The full adder takes a carry also as an input from a previous stage, so that you can chain together uh, full adders to make adders of um, several bits. And the carry is essentially just another bit that gets added. Uh, so x and y gets added, you produce the sum, and the carry comes into it, and that produces a sum. So the final sum is just the sum of all three bits. And then a carry needs to be made if that sum uh, is more than just 0 or 1, if the sum becomes 2 or the maximum, which it can be 3, then the carry has to be output to the carry out. And the condition for this happening is that when you have a carry either in the first half adder or in the second half adder or in both of them, then you have to have a carry output for the next stage. So we start from the lower level module specification which looks very similar to what we have been doing before. Um, so we have the module keyword, we call it now just half add. And we use here a behavioral description in the form of continuous assignments. And the only thing that's new here is that now, rather than computing the XOR for S um, uh, in all detail, we actually should simply put the XOR operator there. So the hat here, that uh, corresponds to the XOR uh, symbol in Verilog. And then the carry is just computed as the AND combination of A and B. Okay, so now we have the half adder defined, and, uh, and that is going to be the lower level module, and the higher level module is the full adder, which uses two of those half adders in order to make the full adder. So the description here in terms of specifying module, giving it a name, having a list of ports, and then declaring input and output ports is just as it was before. We have some internal wires because we need to uh, compute the, the overall carry from um, the carry output 1 and carry output 2, and the sum output of the first half adder becomes the input for the second half adder. So now we instantiate those uh, this uh, lower level module, the half add, which we uh, declared up here. And the way you do this is you write half add, that gives the name of what you want to put in there, or the, the specification of the module. But then you need to be able to distinguish between different modules because they are being placed physically uh, or uh, space is being used physically in the in an FPGA for uh, each particular half adder. Uh, that again uh, reinforces that the fact that uh, this is not just a subroutine where you use the same kind of code and you just uh, simply use uh, that same kind of code twice. You actually place two pieces of half adders uh, into your circuit and they need to have different names. The names that you give them um, are, could be anything. I could have called those U1 and U2 or X1 and X2 or whatever, Teapot1 and Teapot2. Uh, that doesn't really matter. It just needs to be two different names. I chose here to call them HA1 and HA2 for the half adder 1 and half adder 2. And then comes the declaration of the ports or the it's actually not the declaration, the declaration is, is up here of those ports, but uh, filling in the wires that need to be connected to those ports. And for the first half adder, we have the inputs X and Y, and the outputs carry 1 and S1. Okay, so if you go back here to this, we have here X1. Um, Oh, no, I think I called it X and Y. 
So let's leave it as x and y. Okay, so we're going to take this out again. So we, we leave it as x and y, but the output here, that's what I should have labeled, is s1 and c1. So those are intermediate quantities that we have declared as wires in the full adder module. And here is c2. So if you go back now to the full adder module, you can see here we for the first half adder, the outputs are C1 and, and S1, and we have declared those as internal wires. So this is internal wires. And then the second half adder uh, takes as an input S1 and C in, and makes an output C2 and S. So you can see here, through this specification, the output S1 from the first half adder is actually now connected to the X input of the second half adder. And then carry in, that's an external input that comes from up here. Uh, C1 and C2 are both internal outputs. They are being used here in the assign statement to produce the output carry by ORing C1 and C2 together. And the S in here that is the S that then actually goes into the output of the module. So by writing those variables in the corresponding places in those um, uh, spaces in the module that, uh, specification, that's how the actual wiring is being done between those different uh, modules or different units. So the order of the ports, uh, as it is shown here, they must correspond to the order of the ports up in here. So to reinforce that once more, we have here two instantiations of the module half at, and uh, for future reference, again, you have to remember that uh, such modules cannot be inside of a procedural statement or in other words, inside of an always block, for example. As a last example, we're going to take a look at the full adder with a display output. Uh, it's going to be for a seven segment display. And here is the hierarchy of those modules. So the top level module is going to be called full add underbar display. That's the one that is going to interface to the outside world. And then the full add underbar display is going to make use of the full adder that we just described. And that full adder in turn consists of two half adders, which are two submodules or lower level modules of that uh, full add. And then for the display, we use another um, module that is going to be a submodule of the full add dis display uh, top module. And here is what those things look like. So the top level module, the full adder with display, hierarchical design, is declared here. Again, the module declaration, the name of the module, and then all the ports here. We now have three input ports for the carry-in uh, bit X and bit Y, which are the ones that we, are want, that we want to add together. And then we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G for the output of the seven-segment display. Okay, so the seven-segment display is labeled in this way. There is um, A here at the top, then B, C, D, E, F, and the middle thing here, that is G. So those are the seven output lines for the for connecting the display uh, to this module if you were to implement this in hardware. So the inputs are C in, X and Y. The outputs are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then we need some internal wires, X1 and X0. What that is going to be is uh, x0 is going to be the sum out of the full adder and x1 is going to be the carry out of the full adder and the display module is going to convert that to a number uh, between 0 and 3. 
So we instantiate um, the lower level modules again. So we instantiate the full adder uh, by giving the name of the module, then giving a specific name for this instantiation, and then having the list of ports for that module so that we can connect things properly. So for example, the carry input of the top level module gets fed into that full adder as the carry input of the full adder. Same thing for X and Y that gets uh, input here, uh, basically just passed through from, from, the, from the top level module to the full adder module. And then the full adder produces an output X1, X0. Again, X1, that's gonna be the carry and x0 is going to be the sum. And then that goes to the display, display 3 module, which I have named SS here, that particular instantiation. And that has input x1 and x0 as the two-bit input that then produces the seven segment display for the numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the order in which those uh, variables are labeled here must be the same order as it is given in the actual module specification so that we make the appropriate connections. Okay, and then the top level module ends and now we get to see the seven segment display module. So it takes as an input those two bits and then it basically takes um, x1, x0, if it's 0, 0, it displays a 0, 0, 1, it displays a 1 on the 7 segment display, 1, 0 displays a 2, and 1, 1 displays a 3 on the 7 segment display. And the assignments here were just simply made uh, based on the table of what A, B, C, D, E, F, G have to be on those 7 segment displays to have the right numbers show up. And then it's just implemented here as continuous um, behavioral assignments. There was relatively little point trying to make this into a procedural statement, even though we could have used um, the case statement in Verilog to um, specify it that way. But that's something that we'll take a look at in some uh, later video.